Hey everyone, welcome to the show. There are people who live in a dream world and there are people who face reality and then there are some who turn one into the other. The guest on my show today is Muneeb Khaniari, an alumnus from McGill University with a passion for ecology, conservation and wildlife. Muneeb, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. When and how did your interest in all of this exciting field develop? So I was born in Kashmir and I lived there till I was about eight to nine years old and I have really, really fond memories of, you know, my dad and my mom sometimes with my brother. We'd go up into the mountains for treks or just for fishing because my dad was really into fishing. And even when we came to Mumbai, every summer we would go back home oh. to Kashmir. I think that sort of was yeah. the base yeah. for the passion. options you were looking at post your high school? I think that was the most stressful time of the, my mom's life okay. because that was the time where I was sort of not decided at all and I really wanted to do something with wildlife, go out in the wild and what I thought was I didn't really need a degree or like a university setting to do right, that. Right. So I was in this great debate with my mom that you know I should be trying to apply to projects or to internships and go. But then at the same time, there was obviously this idea that, you know, maybe there's some degree out there that does that for me. Right. <laughs> I was really leaning towards this one internship and I was really, really close to taking it in South Africa. And my mom was okay with it too, had McGill not popped up. Oh. course in environmental biology from McGill. Right. So would you like to tell us a little bit about it? So as I said, you know, I ended up looking at McGill's uh, wildlife biology course. I mean, environmental biology course, which had a specialization in wildlife biology. And it turned out to be awesome. Essentially, it turned out to be a three-year course. You know, I only spent about a year and a year and a half at That's Montreal. It. That's oh, it. Okay. <laughs> because oh. it allowed me to like branch out so much. But the course was so great because we had a really uh, close-knit group of uh, teachers. Sure, okay. So, for example, we had courses such as mammalogy where we'd study everything about mammals. So in the class, we had the best mammalogist of no North America, Dr. Humphreys, teaching us. Wow. You know? yeah. But at the same time, we'd go out in the winter snowshoeing to see mammals. With the professor? With the professor oh. and his kids. Oh. And his kids. He had adorable kids. <laughs> I was the only Indian in the whole program. But I felt so comforted because everybody there was filled with passion. You know, everybody liked what they were doing. Yeah. They yeah. liked assignments because assignments were not just assignments. It was something that you were interested in. Like, you know, why does something do what, whatever it does? Yeah. So, for example, it was through professors at McGill that I got the opportunity to get, for example, grants or uh, positions elsewhere right. and earned credits while I was in the field, for oh, example. Okay. And still today, like, you know, I'm done. But when I'm looking for references or if, if I'm looking for ideas, I can always go back to them. Wow. And I think that for a student is one of the best things to have. Absolutely. That relationship with your professor who is so invested in what he or she is doing. Okay, you talk about branching out right. and projects on the field, so we'd love to hear a bit about that. The first thing that comes to mind when I think about branching out was my first semester at McGill. And it turned out that there was a position available in um, Costa Rica, in this national park called Tortuguero, with a company called GVI, Global Vision International. Okay. And they work with other organizations called Panthera, for example, they work with Big Cats, Sea Turtle Conservancy, which works with uh, sea turtles. And it was linked to the Costa Rican government. So the whole um, sort of setup was awesome. It was about there for about five months, okay. sort of, as I said, you know, studying nesting sea turtles with locals and people from Sweden, Australia, the UK. And we, the other project that I was really invested in was identifying jaguars. So what we did was we had about 30 different camera traps, all funded by Panthera, which is one of the best big cat conservation organizations in the world. So we put these camera traps all along, because there was this beach of about 10 kilometers. So we'd put them along different intervals and just record photos. Wow. And you know how people have different faces and you can recognize people with different faces. Jaguars have different spots. That was my first real, like, you know, hands-on yeah. life experience, which was so, so incredible. It was great. And it sounds all like a holiday, yeah. but it is really good, meaningful work because the whole project was geared towards getting all this information so you could ensure that this area was conserved properly. When you come here, the only thing 
that surrounds you is like knowledge and learning. Everyone's part of this one cycle and that was my inspiration to come here. So towards the end of my second year, I went up to probably the best professor, mentor I've had in my life, Dr. Jim Files from McGill University. He's the chairman of a faculty I was in. And I told him, I was born in Kashmir. My family had to leave when I was about eight and the situation there is not great. You know, I've always loved the wildlife there. I've always loved the nature there. And he was intrigued. This guy has only worked in Western Canada for about 50 years of his life. Oh He's about boy. 68 or 69. Oh and both of us sat down, made proposals and got funding to get 20 cameras wow. all the way from Canada down to India. I mean, not even just to India, to Kashmir. Yeah. One place that you'd never fathom something like this coming up. So here I was in the summer of 2014 with about 20 cameras. I basically did this a project where I put these cameras up in Dachigam National Park and for four months I was trekking the mountains and this was awesome because nothing of this sort had been done in the area but where me and my team went was super high into the mountains 15 16000 feet so for about four months we were trekking two three hundred kilometers and it was an awesome awesome project because we came out with two findings which were superb so for example, there's this animal called the Himalayan Sirau, which has been recorded in Kashmir and in the Himalayas, but has never been recorded in Dachigam National Park. So we got uh, three photos of that animal, which was superb. The other big success was, so there's an endemic species in the Dachigam National Park called the Hangul, and they radio collared two Hanguls to see, you know, sort of where they live and where they go seasonally. And one of the Hanguls had been lost. There was no signal of the Hangul at all. So one of my camera traps got a photo of that hangul and we rediscovered that hangul. I mean, yeah. that goes to show that, you know, there's so much to be done there. And then the third one, I was in my last semester at McGill because I got selected for what we call the Panama Field Study Semester. It's in uh, liaison with the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute. Yeah. So basically, uh, I, along with an organization in Panama and a partner of mine, sort of was given this task to get information about a cave called the Chilibre Cave. So we did a bit of background research, realized that this cave had never been explored. Oh, okay. And when you think of the tropics and you think of a cave, you think of bats, yeah. or at least I think of bats. <laughs> <laughs> so what we basically did for about four, four and a half months, we explored it, mapped it out, digitized the map, sort of put it on a um, public platform, and we misnetted for bats. What is, that essentially means is you have this sort of net where bats that are coming out at night, they fly into, you catch them and you sort of ID them, see what species they are, what uh, sex they are, age they are. And all of this is important because this shows which bats are using the cave to sleep in. And this is super important because, and this is the tough part of wildlife biology, to convince people that this information is important. Because these are the bats that are pollinating your fruits, your vegetables, right. especially in Panama. Like all your major fruits, like banana, ca cacao, um, papaya, everything that's commercialized and also for local use is all pollinated by bats. Oh. For example, there is a huge company called Del Monte which sells uh, bananas here in India, in yeah. the US, all, all across. And ketchup. And <laughs> probably, yeah, they have like juice, ketchup, everything. Their bananas are all commercially uh, grown in Costa Rica and Panama, all pollinated by bats. Wow. So it's all about contextualizing your work, yeah. you know. Yeah. So then we sort of made this report and gave it to Anam. Anam is like the environmental department of the Panamanian government and something called RELCOM, which is this organization that works towards bat conservation in the whole of Latin America. And I'm really proud to say that a few students from Universidad de Panama, so that's the Panamanian University, are continuing our project. And this is just to say that for everyone out there, there's always something that you want to do. So don't be discouraged by the sort of line that you're given. Like even I was given 64 credits for my major, right. 24 for my specialization, and I could have done that. And that's perfectly fine. But what you need to understand is you have to grow out of it if you want to grow out of it to get something more. And there will be people like Dr. Files there to help you. Well, following your passion undoubtedly is the best thing to do. But in this investment banking <laughs> sort of age, sure. how do you see this commercially uh, working out for Sure. You? I mean, I think that's a really valid question and I think that's a really valid concern both for people in this and like, for example, our parents. But I can reassure everybody out there that, you know, there's tons and tons of 
money available for this domain. And there's organizations, there's individuals, there's governments willing to give you that money to do this sort of work. So for example, right now, I'm done with college. So the earning that I have right now is a Nat Geo grant. So to do work down in the Andamans. Wow. So within the grant, I have sort of my earnings, sort of my salary, if you want to call it that. You have to realize, you know, do you want to be affiliated with private donors? Do you want to sort of get into a government job? Do you want to, you know, sort of, you have to find your niche. There's a lot of grants out there, which right. are startup grants. Right. Like, you know, not too much money, but if you do convincing work, and what does convincing work mean? It means if you meet what you've written in your grant, 99.9% you'll get follow-up grants. So you build a sort of credibility for yourself and then you keep getting grants after grants after grants. So what I would certainly say, you know, to start off, it's a bit competitive. Uh, don't be scared to have six months or eight months volunteering or doing internships, potentially without pay. Because if there's one thing that has its weight in gold in this domain, it's experience. What advice would you want to give a high school student looking to pursue a career in environmental biology? I think it's important for everyone out there to sort of see what thrills them. You know, uh, does it really thrill you that you keep thinking about it every two, three days or whatever? Because that really will ensure that you know you want to follow yeah. it. The other thing that I would say that, you know, the, the domain of wildlife, it's not less important than any other domain. Yeah. The reason why we have engineers is because we need cities to work, we need uh, our societies to function. In a similar direct or indirect manner, you need the environment and the wildlife. So absolutely. it's absolutely important. I mean, I can guarantee you there's a whole bunch of students out there today who are thinking, you know, I really love wildlife and I want to get into wildlife, but is it really that important? Is it, does it really have the income as we spoke about? So right. the advice that I will give you is embrace that passion. You can't train yourself into loving staying no, in a cave for no, six months. No, no, no. You can't train yourself into sort of risking your life, literally risking your life in the depths of, let's say, a, a rainforest. It's something that comes to you. Yeah. So for all the people out there who sort of feel they have that, embrace it first and then be patient with it because there's going to be a lot of struggles that come up. But trust me, it's going to be worth it if you have that passion. Essentially, the only prerequisite would be passion. passion okay. But then you develop skills. That's something that helped me a lot was writing skills. Right. So the biggest example is right now, I'm trying to get permits to do work down in the Andamans. So I have to convince the government that you know the sort of ecology work I'm doing on these islands is useful for the country. But then at the same time, I have to convince the scientific uh, society that you know the scientific work, yeah. work I'm doing is robust. So the way you write about it, the way you approach is a super important skill set. I mean, apart from that, the other skills that you will grow into would be perhaps photography because it's just one of those things that you get your hands on and you really want to capture every moment that's yeah. out there. If you're traveling abroad, working abroad in different cultures, I don't know if I can call this a skill, but for a lack of a better word, a skill would be just this cultural sort of sensitivity right. or sort of adapting, you know, being okay with not being okay for a bit, maybe a language. Like yeah. for example, when I was working in Panama, I had no background in Spanish. I realized I was going to be living and working there for about four or five months and almost everybody speaks Spanish. So, you know, that's another skill that I, I personally thought I wanted to bring into my repertoire. Right. Okay, Vinny, tell us about some of the other colleges that have similar or equally good programs. The whole domain of wildlife or environmental biology, as we call it, sort of just becomes vast when you go into grad school. Okay. So, sort of for your okay. PhDs and your masters. But at an undergraduate level, there's so much out there. Like a lot of people get stuck in this domain of biology right. because it's sort of like a safeguard, which is not a bad idea. Okay. But if you're looking for really awesome specific wildlife schools around the world, for example, there was this one college that came up. It was in Wales called okay. Glamorgan. Okay. It's a superb college. Over three or four years, it essentially uh, makes you stay at Glamorgan for about a year and a half okay. and for about a year and a half to two and a half years or something like this you're traveling South Africa, Cuba and I think Indonesia wow. so it really integrates like it's a structured program unlike what you exactly. sort of tried to create I, exactly what I was gonna say I was sort of like you know running from one person to the other trying to get grants trying to get right. support to do all these things in Panama blah 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 but this will get you to do that 
for example, in the United States, Princeton University has one of the best ecology and evolution sort of domains. Most of the times, you might not have programs <clears throat> labeled as wildlife. Right. But you know, there's domains within wildlife, ecology, evolution, conservation, biogeography, you name it. UCLA has one of the best programs for, again, ecology related stuff, ecology and conservation related stuff across the Latin America. And Canada has some of the best universities related to environment in general, not so much with wildlife. There's a huge importance that the government and the mm -hmm. people give to wildlife. So you know, that's reflected in their university Programs, system. Yeah. So for all the undergrads out there, there's opportunities galore. But as I said, it just opens up. UK, for example, has some of the best organizations because the way UK works is when they go into grad school, many um, uh, universities sort of combined. So you'll have Oxford, Imperial and Cambridge working together for some sort of ecology project in oh. somewhere. So you know the opportunities, the fundings just go crazy. It's just that you need to sort of have a clue as to what you want to do and sort of tap into that. So what would you think would be your future career path? I'm saying there could be grad school, sure. there could be projects, there sure. could be living in India, working overseas. How is it going to pan out for you? I see myself working on different projects uh, in different habitats because with different habitats come different skill sets on projects that are sort of invested in ecology mm -hmm. so you know out there in the field but have a conservation implication okay so to have a better understanding of this I'm going down to the Andamans starting right. January right. to study a bird called the Narcondum hornbill okay. which is only found on this one tiny island called the Narcondum island so what I'm doing there is to study this bird's ecology like what is it feeding on what are the what is the competition it has for feeding because when you understand these concepts you'll see how you can better conserve this bird i see myself hopefully going up to kazakhstan next summer because i've been in talk with a professor from bristol university who's really really invested in this problem with the saigas they're an antelope they're a very critically endangered species and about 75 percent of their population just died off last year and we don't know how and why I think quite often as an Indian you will have to answer the question as to do you want to continue pursuing things in India, do you want to work abroad. Going abroad means you get more exposure, you get acquainted to a lot more cultures, you meet a lot more people so that's awesome. In India this domain sadly right now has one big problem which is the whole bureaucratic system that we have here. Okay. So if I want to do research, for example, down in the Andaman, I need permits. But then the whole process is so slow and oh, bureaucratic. Sad. I think we need more people in this domain to make this more accountable and more, you know, sort of streamlined. But I would strongly encourage anybody and everybody to sort of branch out and then branch in. Yes, let, let us go abroad. I'm doing the same thing. But let's go abroad, get all the knowledge and resources we acquire there okay. and sort of streamline and hopefully better the system that's there in India. So what would you say would be that one thing that defined your stay at Mughal? So by the end of it, I only spent one whole winter semester there, but that winter semester really taught me how to sort of embrace your surroundings. The reason why I say that is Montreal is one of the trendiest cities. Like you have people wearing the trendiest clothes, you know, it's artsy, all of that sort of thing. But when it comes to the uh, cold, people will dress up and nobody cares how you look, what you're wearing. As long as you're warm, that's the way to be. Every January ending, February starting, there's something called the Igloo Fest in the Old City, which is literally the coldest part of the winter. Your, your temperatures are going down to negative 35. Wow. That's a breathtaking temperature. I mean, but everybody's out there because it's sort of like a trance music festival and there's it's outdoors. So everybody's like huddling together with these huge jackets and everything and just embracing the winter, you know? You're living for six months of your life, I mean, you're, you're rather, um, in winter. So might as well just make the most of it. And that really... I think I wouldn't have had that experience had I not been in Montreal. Fabulous. Thank exactly. you so much, Muni, for being on the show. It's been such a hugely rewarding experience for me and it's I'm sure for some of the viewers. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Thank you. <laughs> Please click the subscribe button below. Like me at facebook.com slash chatchat101. Follow my Twitter handle, chatchat101 or at Instagram, chatchat101. Please leave your comments in the sections below. And if you'd like me to feature any particular college, please let me know. Thank you.